Welcome to Parallax by Anka Kalra, a podcast produced by Radcliffe Cardiology to bring you a new angle of all things cardiology and the best from the US Cardiology Review. Published every second Monday, Anka Kalra, MD, interventional cardiologist at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, USA, speaks with legendary cardiologists, reviews late-breaking trials, and interviews authors of our latest and best US cardiology review articles. We call them hashtag audio articles. Parallax is the effect whereby the position or direction of an object appears to differ when viewed from different positions. So this podcast is your fix of reliable updates on all things cardiology by someone from a non-traditional background who is always looking at the industry from a new angle. Now, here's your host, Anka Kalra, MD. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Ankur Kalra. I'm back with uh, yet another episode of Parallax. Um, we've been recording on a fairly frequent basis because these are unprecedented times for all of us. Uh, today on the show, I have with me two cardiologists um, who've put together a comprehensive paper on COVID-19 pandemic and its effects on the cardiovascular system. Um, this is a this is an evolving area, as all of us know, and um, we were just talking off the line, Andrew and I were talking, um, the the literature is rapidly evolving and is changing by the hour. So we wanted to um, do this uh, podcast and get the paper out simultaneously because we probably know that you know a couple of weeks from now this information may be outdated or requires another update. Um, so without much further ado, I would like to introduce both my guests on the show today, uh, Andrew Sauer is uh, the director of the um, heart failure and the transplant program at uh, the University of Kansas Health System. He's an associate professor. And Aniket is a trained cardiologist who is now finishing up his training in critical care medicine. So I have a lot of respect for individuals like Aniket because very few of such individuals exist. And you know, for the listeners who listen to Parallax regularly just uh, two episodes ago, we had Dr. Ann Gage, who is a cardiologist, an interventional cardiologist, and also an intensivist. So, Aniket, thank you for uh, doing what you're doing in terms of uh, getting trained in both critical care medicine and cardiovascular diseases. And then I, I hear that you would be a um, transplant cardiologist as well. So kudos to you for all the training. And uh, thank you both again for uh, putting this paper together. Andrew, I'll start with you. Um, I mean, these are unprecedented times and um I, I don't think we've seen quite anything like this before. Yes, and thank you for having me. And that's absolutely true. I think one of the things that's most um, impactful, in my mind, is just how rapidly progressing the data that's coming out uh, has really kind of overwhelmed us. Um, you know, I think it's also really exciting because I think the dissemination of information across social media platforms. I think is really unprecedented what we're seeing right now. And I think the reality is as cardiologists, as critical care physicians, as uh, nurse practitioners and nurses on the front line, we have to become very proficient at COVID-19, its impact on the cardiovascular population, which as we know is the most vulnerable population um, to suffer from this disease and in all of the data sets we've seen. And in a sense, we have to become local experts uh, very quickly. And so I'm very grateful for all our colleagues across the country who have been openly and willingly sharing information. I just came across a really well done slide deck by some residents, uh, you know, who shared this slide deck. Um, I actually want to shout out their names because I think they deserve some credit. Um, Dr. Rostin and Molson at the University of British Columbia. Some really good slides that have been posted on Twitter. And I think that the reality is we have to keep up with this. And so we're, we're happy to be here and talk about what we're learning. Um, I didn't expect to have to learn a lot about epidemiology of pandemics, but we're learning and we're all learning together. Yes. And um, Aniket, um, 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 I think... We, we lost Aniket, uh, so till he joins again. Um, um, Andrew, I still have you on the line. Yeah. Um, so just, you know, diving in um, straight into this. Uh, so Andrew, l like we were talking, it started in Wuhan and then has pretty much um, taken the world by storm. Um, you know, over 140 countries have now reported 
that they have the COVID-19 uh, pandemic situation. And, um, you know, we, we all know what has happened in China and Italy, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, what, what can we learn from experiences from both these countries? Um, and, and it still is befuddling to me when I see, um, you know, video footage of um, a, a lot of people gathering a, a, at the beaches, for example, in Florida, we, like we were just talking. Um, and, um, you, you know, you, you know, I think fortunately for us in, in Ohio, our, our governor has been at the forefront of dealing with, uh, this pandemic and, you know, urging everyone for social isolation and uh, social distancing and, you know, self-isolation. So before we get into the cardiac complications, uh, you know, let's just, um, uh, delve into, um, the importance of, uh, social distancing. For the pandemic. Yeah, I think uh, in terms of lessons learned, I think there's so much that we need to learn and continue to also implement what we've already learned. You know, there's sort of two types of errors in healthcare and, and also innovation and, and other types of activities, you know, errors of ignorance and errors of negligence. And I think one of the challenges and one of the frustrating things when we see this epidemic is I think everyone's allowed to be somewhat ignorant to a virus that the world has never seen. Uh, For example, early on as this was coming out, even I was kind of saying, you know, why are people worried so much about this? I mean, flu kills so many people. And we saw a lot of um, political orientation surrounding that narrative as well, unfortunately. Um, But as I learned more about what the differences are, um, of course, the obvious difference is a completely different virus. but, But in terms of how it how it's distributed are not being higher. The fact that um, it's it's transmitting and it's and it's and it's something that the entire world is naive to. I realized very quickly that that was ignorance, and I had to become much more educated. And I think that first thing is, as a community of healthcare uh, practitioners, we have to not let ourselves be ignorant of what's going on. But then, more importantly, when we have learned the lessons of um, you know, social distancing in other countries. Uh, we saw the very extreme draconian, as they've said, uh, measures taken in China, um, not really taken up or adopted in Italy very well, and not not really done a great job in the larger Europe as well. And what we're seeing is we should be learning those lessons. We've had plenty of time to prepare for those things. And unfortunately, across the country, despite the messages of stay home, we've seen a lot of, uh, especially young people, kind of erroneously assuming that because they're young and healthy, that they're safe and they don't seem to understand or want to implement activities to suggest that they are going to reduce the transmission of the disease. And, and as has been reported, you know, the number one way for patients to become infected is from somebody in their sphere of contacts who actually doesn't know that they're infected. We saw that um, from the the world's data so far, and and we're seeing that uh, play out as community spread in in America today. And of course, our cardiovascular patients are among the most vulnerable. We must do everything we can to protect them. So there's been a lot of creative strategies for how to do that using uh, telehealth and remote monitoring technologies, reducing elective cases, uh, uh, you know, and so much is happening across the country and figuring out ways to reduce exposure to our most vulnerable patients. Yes, I um, I couldn't agree more. Um, and um, you know, I, like I like you said, and uh, like we are realizing, um, this is evolving very quickly, and we are learning uh, by the hour. And um, with a lot of new data emerging from uh, you know Italy and, and China, and uh, and also on social media. I mean, I think what a time to be on social media and be on Twitter and actually get all these updates from colleagues from all over the world. You know, just not limited to Um, you know, your own hospital or your own state, but, you know, even nationally and internationally. Uh, Aniket, um, um, if you're on the call with us, um, my question to you is actually from the paper. So, um, you know, I I would urge everyone to read this paper because it's uh, a concise summary of all the cardiovascular complications from COVID-19. And we'll we'll begin with uh, one of the most common um, questions we get asked as cardiologists on on the cardiology consultation service, and that is the question around high sensitivity cardiac troponin. So uh, it it appears to be that from the data that's published, you know, about seventeen percent of patients who were COVID uh, nineteen patients had uh, 
positive troponin. Um, Aniket, if you're if you're not with us, then Andrew, if you want to uh, answer that question for us. Yeah, it looks like there's a really interesting observation related to troponin elevation. So I think what's also interesting about this is the time course. Um, when you look at when the troponin elevation occurs, it actually happens much later in the course. And so um, it really starts to, to pick up, you know, from this Lancet paper uh, with Zhao et al. as the, uh, as the primary author. Uh, you know, it really looks like the inflection point for troponin rise in the cases where this was seen and observed is is beyond two weeks. You know, sort of as the patient is getting a lot more respiratory symptoms, uh, the patient may not necessarily have significant uh, markers of uh, myocardial injury. But it seems like as the course progresses, we see some of these spikes in troponin beyond 16, kind of at the 16, 19, 22 day period. And it's very clear that those patients who succumb to complications and complications are still not really well described. And we have some larger categories like arrhythmias, but the Chinese data that we've seen doesn't really break down between atrial fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia all that well. But regardless, we know that troponin elevation is associated with myocardial injury. Uh, Mechanism is a complex thing to seize out. But the fact that we are seeing this late should imply that as clinicians, we need to recognize that just because someone may not have biomarker uh, presence uh, of troponin early on doesn't mean they're not going to develop it as the ARDS potentially is starting to resolve. In fact, many of the cardiovascular deaths seem to be at the more tail end of the, of the, of the disease, even as patients are starting to recover from ARDS then they're having a lot of these cardiac complications associated with this elevation in troponin. What is clear, though, is that those patients who had complications and death um, were more likely to be in the category of patients that had troponin elevation, which is, of course, similar to many cohorts that we have in cardiovascular disease. So we should really take the troponin very seriously. Um, the, The more complex and nuanced challenge is how to how to approach the troponin elevation in terms of identifying what kind of myocardial injury pattern we're looking at. Yes. So, you know, from the paper, the patients who had, uh, and this is all comers. uh, So the patients who had troponin um, who were COVID-19 positive, uh, you know, the, the proportion is very telling. I mean, I think it's 59% versus 1% um, who actually survived versus did not survive. So, you know, like you said, the troponin should not be taken lightly in these patients. And, you know, thank you for educating us that the the peak was a, a late peak. It was not an early peak. So something to keep in mind. Um, just to delve a little bit of, um, on the on the mechanism. And, you know, this has been an, an area of uh, controversy, uh, if I if I may say that word. Um, you know, leading the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, and the Heart Failure Society of America to come out with um, a joint statement about use of um, angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers in patients with uh, with underlying heart disease and the SARS coronavirus or the novel coronavirus uh, disease infection. The receptor that the virus is utilizing to enter the host cell is the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor. And, you know, we, you and I both know, I'm sure all the cardiologists will appreciate that. And, you know, one of the, from, from the data that has come out of uh, both China and Italy, one of the most prevalent underlying disease condition in, in patients who had severe forms of infection was hypertension. And, um, you know, hypertension and underlying heart disease you and I and all the cardiologists know that one of the most commonly prescribed medications is an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker. And what that may do is if you have prescribed someone on on that medication, then, um, you know, the body's natural response is to upregulate its receptors. And, you know, some, now obviously these are all postulations at this point. And, you know, we obviously want to be responsible in not spreading misinformation, but it's 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 at least a question in the investigator's mind and the clinician's mind and those on the front lines that there may be an interplay here, and I, I'll I'll have you extrapolate more on this. 
Yeah. And this is, again, I think we had to all go back to medical school uh, textbook uh, reminders and kind of remind ourselves of what's at play here, because I think there's been a lot of confusion around this topic. So, again, I think just to reinforce, you know, some of these facts so that people can be less confused, we're talking sometimes about different receptors. So there's angiotensin uh, one receptor and angiotensin two. And obviously the, the virus is getting attention because of its, its interaction with the angiotensin two receptor. It's important for people to recognize that the angiotensin receptor blocker is targeting angiotensin one. So the first area of confusion, which I will openly admit I was confused by, because I had forgotten many of these basic science questions uh, from my second year of med school. But remember that if you're going to use a medicine like Losartan, an angiotensin receptor blocker, that is not going to um, antagonize the angiotensin II receptor, which is the receptor that uh, is at play as it relates to COVID-19. So that that should help clarify that. Um, The question, though, is... ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers have been shown to upregulate ACE2 uh, in animal studies. And so one of the questions is, are the angiotensin receptor blockers and ACE inhibitors playing an indirect role in increasing the uh, impact or transmission of COVID-19? I mean, this is all hypothesis, uh, conjecture, really. And, and, so again, some have said, well, maybe we just need to get rid of the ACE inhibitor or the angiotensin receptor blocker. Uh, there's some basic science uh, papers out there that I think have led to some confusion and not necessarily clarity on this topic. And so there had been, at least I think earlier this week and maybe even last week, some some potential advocating out there for just discontinuing patients for those medicines, ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker. I think the reason why the societies have come out so strongly and said, let's not do that is because obviously there's potential downside, particularly for our heart failure population, where you have them admitted and then you just remove their angiotensin receptor blocker or ACE inhibitor or their, um, or their Entresto, their, their Secubitril Valsartan. Uh, and, and we all know that that generally is associated with worse outcomes for our heart failure and our cardiovascular patients. So some very legitimate concerns out there about prematurely removing those therapies for patients who need them for their chronic disease in the setting of acute decompensation. And so for now, the recommendation, I think very appropriately is unless they're hypotensive and in shock or things like that, uh, really the usual um, approach should be taken where we continue guideline-based medical therapies for heart flare. We continue treating their hypertension with the medication regimen they're on uh, because of the wide benefits of ACE inhibitor and angiotensin receptor blocker in this population. And let's not change how we utilize those therapies just because we think someone might have COVID-19 or just because they are uh, proven to be infected. And again, further complicating this challenge is in many places, including my own institution, the turnaround time for COVID-19 testing is three days. And so you have this question mark. And so I think all all the more reason to say, let's just stay with the patient's medical therapies as they're on, unless they're heading into cardiogenic shock, which of course sets up a whole new algorithm of care. Um, Let's not use COVID-19 as a reason to stop these life-saving therapies. Hopefully that helps explain it a little bit better. Yes, no, thanks for explaining it to me and explaining it to our listeners and our audience. Um, you explained it very well. Um, I think the, the question on, upregul- on, on upregulation, I think, is a valid question that hopefully would be answered by um, epidemiological and, and also prospective data as we you know, gather more information on, on, on baseline patient characteristics um, for... Um, for the COVID-19 affected patients. Moving on to cardiac arrhythmias. Um, so you did t- touch upon this uh, briefly when we were talking about, uh, uh, you know, um, tropononemia uh, and uh, other forms of uh, manifestations of heart disease. Is troponin elevation? So first of all, you know, the mechanism of arrhythmia, you think there is underlying myocarditis um, um, that's leading to arrhythmias or um, is it, uh, is it some form of an acute coronary syndrome that's leading to arrhythmias or is it totally unrelated and is uh, arrhythmias alone is one of the manifestations of the, um, of the virus? 
Yeah, I think it's an unknown right now in terms of what does the troponin mean in terms of mechanism of injury. I think the first thing we have to recognize is troponin elevation is associated with increased risk of myocardial related events, arrhythmias, be it atrial fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia, coronary coronary syndromes are also associated with troponin elevation. And of course, um, cardiovascular mortality and cardiogenic shock is kind of all bundled in there. I think it would be presumptuous to start to pin every troponin elevation that we see with this disease on a consistent homogeneous mechanism. I mean, we know that the disease is behaving somewhat homogeneously as it relates to the the, the stereotypical pattern of ARDS and, and lung injury. I mean, you've seen a lot of the images, including our paper, is going to have the stereotypical image uh, presented for people to remind themselves of what it looks like. But because the cardiovascular population is so heterogeneous, it would be very presumptuous to assume that a troponin elevation is obviously myocarditis or obviously acute coronary syndrome. I think you have to use the usual bedside clinical skill set that we always do. Look at the 12 lead ECG, look at the patient's symptoms and symptom presentation, and be careful assuming that it's just, you know, a type 2 MI or uh, myocardial injury due to demand ischemia from cardiogenic shock or myocarditis or acute coronary syndrome. It could be any of those things uh, because these patients, by definition, are at risk for any of those things. Um, there's a lot of reason to believe that um, there may be some um, direct uh, myocardial injury from the virus itself. Um, there's also reason to believe that um, there may be a hyperinflammatory state, particularly later in the disease, which I think is interesting how that seems to associate also with the peak in troponin and the, and the uh, kind of inflection point of the rise of troponin. So it does make us wonder if for the patients that progress to that later stage and in that hyperinflammatory state, if maybe there's a little bit of a unique pathophysiology going on there. Uh, and of course, there's some early reports of potential uh, for immune suppressive therapies, IVIG, and things of that sort. But again, I think we're so early in this that we need more data to really make any um, strong conclusions about the mechanism of injury. I think the most important thing we do as cardiologists is make sure that we're still present to be consultative and helpful to our patients and manage the complications together uh, because it's still not entirely clear how much of the arrhythmias are going to be atrial versus ventricular. Uh, but we have had a lot of uh, descriptions in the, in the existing epidemiologic data that cardiovascular death is one of the mechanisms that these patients die. Uh, and obviously that can be pump failure or that can be uh, arrhythmogenic death. So in your paper, you describe a case of fulminate myocarditis from the SARS coronavirus 2 infection, which was treated successfully with a combination of immunoglobulin and, and steroids. Um, have you seen, um, and I know that, that case was probably reported from the, from the East, but have, have you seen, have you come across or have you seen any cases or you've at least heard about cases in the US, you know, from New York or from Seattle? Any, any such cases? Yeah, I have. I mean, there's the... The Seattle experience was just recently published um, in a letter, and I don't know that they have – I didn't see in the fine print whether they described that exact mechanism of death. But in the Seattle experience, um, again, just, just reported in JAMA uh, in, a, in a research letter, I think yesterday, uh, you know, 42 percent of the patients um, presenting – uh, to the intensive care unit had background congestive heart failure. And again, they still described a significant proportion of them with troponin elevation as well as with BNP elevation. And so you can see that there is a, there is a theme here that patients can prog progress to myocardial uh, injury, myocardial dysfunction. Um, but like, like all patients who present to the hospital with heart failure, and potentially myocarditis, these presentations tend to be highly unique in their own way. And even the distinction between fulminant myocarditis outside of COVID-19 versus a more smoldering lymphocytic type, you know, low level myocarditis, it can be very difficult to make these distinctions, particularly when there's there's not pathologic uh, diagnosis. You know, when you can't see slides under the microscope, it can be very difficult to make those distinctions. 
Um, but typically when we describe fulminant myocarditis, we're describing a hemodynamic uh, syndrome of really kind of the crash and burn, you know, uh, to the point where a discussion is around uh, VA ECMO. Um, I know Anakit um, and their team in Houston have been taking care of a patient who, as of yesterday, was yet to be ruled in for COVID-19, but appeared to be uh, presenting clinically like COVID-19 ARDS and actually ended up receiving uh, VA ECMO for what appeared to be a fulminant myocarditis. So it does appear to be emerging as a subset, although it looks like most of the descriptions of the need for extracorporeal life support across the world uh, seem to be more focused on uh, the utilization of VV ECMO for uh, advanced uh, respiratory disease and ventilatory disease. Um, but I think the the reports that are coming out uh, are very mixed. Um, it, it is unclear yet the role that ECLS will play. There is an ongoing development of a registry across the world, particularly in the East. And I have seen as recently as today, uh, a number of centers across America on social media, Twitter, talking about um, building a similar prospective registry for centers here in the U.S. that are having a high burden of uh, what may be fulminant myocarditis or heart failure patients who are just tipping over. Um, and again, I think it's just moving fast. I think we're going to have a lot more information in a week, to be honest. But right now, it's a little unclear how to treat the more fulminant myocarditis patients differently than potentially the patients with chronic heart failure like we saw in Seattle, uh, who are obviously just much more vulnerable to complications and decompensation here. Yes. So, you know, moving over to therapy, I I know some of the antivirals have been tested. Actually, um, was it just yesterday that the New England published a randomized control trial of the HIV drug, um, the lopinavir-ritonavir combination, the brand name is Kaletra, uh, for those who are more familiar with with, with Kaletra than with the um, generic names. Are there any, the, 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 I mean, it seems to be that um, just, um, you know, intensive care uh, and good ventilatory management and, and managing the cardiovascular complications and hoping that patients will survive through this is is all that we have in the armamentarium right now. I mean, I, I think the, the, I shouldn't really call it reassuring because, you know, the like you said, R-naught is very high and the case fatality ratio that is being reported out of out of both China and Italy um, is anywhere between three to seven percent, which are not low numbers when you consider the entire population at risk. Um, but you know, most of us are, are going to have a mild infection, but we don't really know who's going to have a severe form of infection, right? Um, I think we have markers of patients that, yeah, obviously, the troponin being one, uh, who might be more at risk for complications, and it probably has implications for monitoring. But the reality is from the reports we're seeing, you know, we're hearing about antiviral therapies. We're hearing about potential utilization and role for steroids and IVIG uh, and anti-inflammatory immune modulating therapies. Uh, We're hearing about chloroquine, but it's all very premature and and it's very muddy. And and, and some, some therapies appear to be not helping. I think right now where we are today uh, is we're at supportive care. And I think we're still in the era of mitigation where we really need to focus on the the public being laser focused on improving our social distancing because that's the best we have right now. And I think the other thing we learned from Italy and China, uh, I think uh, China seemed to get this message and then really do something about it in terms of personal protective equipment for the healthcare workers. But in both countries and now in the United States, the challenge we face is the healthcare providers delivering the care themselves become, you know, vectors of transmission and oftentimes minimally symptomatic or asymptomatic. And a big component of the progression of uh, dissemination of the virus is our, our own healthcare workers. And so I think most important today is social distancing for the public and improving the protection of our healthcare workers as we're, as we're, as we've all heard, flattening and slowing the curve so that we can get to a vaccine so that we can get to therapies and understanding therapies. And obviously there are trials now across the country. I know Seattle's participating, MGH just announced that they're participating, the Chinese and the Australians are participating in several trials. And many of our centers across the country have the opportunity to participate in trials to find out what the best therapies are. 
but we're not there yet. <clears throat> and so really everything that that's going out there in terms of therapy, such as chloroquine, which is getting a lot of attention. As far as I know, uh, from the literature I've seen, we're still in a very early stage and, and it's somewhat, you know, anecdotal. Uh, so we have a lot to do. But what we can do is is take the information we have today and, and work on what we can work on, which is in, improving social distancing in the public, protecting our healthcare workers and learning the lessons uh, that we hopefully should have learned by now. Uh, my friend Lisa Rosenbaum uh, is a correspondent for the New England Journal of Medicine. She wrote a very compelling uh, piece about how devastating this has been in Italy, recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine this week. I encourage everybody to read that because it, it takes the it takes the perspective of not only what are the data that can teach us and what is the knowledge that we should that we should already be using at the bedside, but the personal and ethical dilemmas that are faced by the Italians right now as they've become completely overwhelmed, um, I think is is a message that we have to really take to heart and the public needs to take to heart. So we need to get the word out that this is really uh, not posturing. It's not fear mongering. It's not panic. Uh, many of us go through that stage as we're learning about this, where we think, oh, come on, it's really not that bad. But the more you read, the more you study, the more you pay attention to what other people across the country are dealing with, you realize that we really have to really get moving and take this more seriously. Yes. No, thank you for spreading the word on, uh, you know, on seriousness, uh, around this, because, um, you know, you like you said. You know, I think um, all of us were skeptical to begin with, but w- what we saw coming out of Italy and and now with all the manuscripts and, and papers and literature getting published from China, uh, you know, this is something which is which is unprecedented, has not been seen before. It obviously is going to have uh, significant ramifications on 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 us as healthcare providers and you know, on society at large and our, our families at large. And I, I'm glad you brought up the paper that Lisa published. Uh, I read that paper. Um, we actually have been trying to get Lisa um, on the show. And, you know, I think we were all um, set up to record an episode and then um, the pandemic broke. And obviously she, being the correspondent for the New England Journal, got extremely busy uh, in, in putting this together. Um, but, you know, I agree. I think it's... Um, you know, the, like she says, uh, you know, I think it's better to be accused um, of being overprepared. Uh, I think that is a better outcome of this pandemic th- than um, than than the alternative, which is not a good one. Um, you know, looking at what what has happened to our colleagues in in Italy. Um, now let's let's talk about uh, so just uh, you know bring finishing up the uh, the drugs. Uh, I think. Uh, you brought it up. I mean, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine are, are both anti-malarial agents have been around for decades. Um, there are data that they do slow down uh, the the, glyco- uh, the glycosylation process for the receptors, um, but the, the, these are in vitro data. And you know, like you said, um, the only study that we have now is a non-randomized open-label trial, which came out of, of France. It's I don't think I've seen it published in a, in a journal. I think some people have just put the PDF on on Twitter, and I think it's um, uh, you know it's complementary to all the information that we've learned uh, on Twitter, and you know I, I think it's um, hopefully it's not it's not mis- misinformation. I mean, I, I went through the paper; it, it seems like a well well done, non randomized, open label study. But like you said, we we need to accrue more more data, which is stringent and. And, and done in a, in a randomized fashion. I mean, the, our, our Chinese colleagues have, sh- have shown us that even in, in a pandemic situation, they could do a randomized control trial with, with Kalitra. So I, I'm sure um, we can get better data and we will learn as we go through this together. Um, but moving on to um, patients with transplant, right? I mean, the, this is a subset which is an immunocompromised cohort and you know, patients who are immunocompromised are not doing well with the infection like they, they do with most other infections. I mean, you know, transplant recipients are uh, of, you know, orthotropic heart transplantation. They are on immunosuppressive agents. And to have an infection, uh, which you don't have the treatment for, they're not going to do well. But I, I should not be talking about this. Uh, you, you should be the one who should be talking about this. So let's hear from you on on what your takes are for patients who are a, either being considered for transplant or have received transplant or patients who 
need to get a heart from someone who was uh, infected with COVID. I think both, I think these, uh, all these topics are, are very important to talk about. Yeah, it's a little bit more of a niche topic for the general cardiology community, but it definitely is very central to my particular role as the medical lead for our heart transplant program and also in my role that I serve on Region 8 of the United Network of Oregon Sharing as we continue to deliberate and and debate what what this means for the transplant candidate population as well as those who have been transplanted. So, you know, every center is grappling with this um, and it's moving again day by day, hour by hour. And just last night, we had a communication from our local organ procurement organization about the challenges that they're facing with getting tests uh, of the donors to turn around promptly. It's unclear to me why the donor population wouldn't be seen as pressing and as in need of testing promptly as our as our general community population. But it does seem that at least locally in my region, we're having a disparity between the ability to get a test of a donor compared to a patient who's admitted to our health system. Um, in other words, the donor population seems to be taking longer. And again, that's just information in the last 24 hours. That could change next week, and it might have been different earlier in the week. And in fact, I know it was easier on Monday. But the reality is, as uh, transplant cardiologists and transplant surgeons, we're facing this reality where day by day, the ability to access organs safely and know that they're not infected uh, is increasingly more complex and challenging. And so one way that this is being dealt with across the country, and again, this is just from many of us talking to each other, emailing each other, other program directors across the country, is stable patients lower on the list, such as patients stable with a VAD. Most programs are moving away from transplanting those population at all because there's this unknown risk of transmission uh, either from the donor or a patient with an LVAD who gets a transplant who's sitting in our ICU then gets contaminated or infected by a member of the staff participating in the transplant or from a patient nearby. And again, since we've got all these patients out there that we can't even see that have the have the infection and the community spread is thought to be so rampant and we're not even able to effectively test for their community spread, it compounds the challenge and compounds the problem. Um, but the more complicated ethical question is, and I, I would imagine in New York City, this is extremely stressful, is what do you do about someone who's in the ICU with a balloon pump or an impella or on ECMO who is going to die if they don't get access to a vital life-saving donor, donor heart? You know, wow, that's, that's a very challenging situation because your recipient environment in New York has to be a little bit scary right now because it's clear that New York City is becoming somewhat overrun. Um, and then you also have the concern about where the donor is and how confident can you be that the donor is is not infected. Um, I can't speak to what everybody's doing because to some extent, um, transplant program directors don't always advertise their strategy, um, but it does seem like that's going to be a daily challenge. Uh, I will say, though, that the heart transplant recipients that are out there, when they practice social distancing, like we do for everybody, um, they should be okay. A recently published survey of 87 heart transplant recipients, um, and this is China data, uh, had a very low infection rate uh, for those that practice social distancing. And so Mandeep um, just uh, reported this, the JHLT that you know just posted this uh, recently on Twitter. I think that's an important paper to take a look at. Because I think we we really worry a lot more about our immunosuppressed transplant population, especially those with cardiac transplant, because we wonder about the direct mechanism of injury that might be at play related to the virus and the myocardium, as we've already discussed. But it does appear that they're generally doing okay as long as they practice social distancing. So in our program, we've implemented the usual routine, minimizing elective clinic visits with transplant patients, minimizing unnecessary procedures and biopsies. We still have to do our surveillance monitoring, but I think it's all part of the same process is if you can do a telehealth or remote monitoring visit, then that's the best option for those patients. What are you particularly doing for patients who require surveillance biopsies? Uh, I mean, how, how, how can you, is, can you make that decision um, clinically, um, looking at biopsies, previous biopsies, or looking at the at the um, 
post-transplant course of that particular patient? So the answer is you can and you can't. Um, so early on, uh, post-transplant, and this is another part of the complication of deciding to transplant someone now. If we transplant someone tonight, we've now committed them to a certain number of surveillance biopsies early on to reassure us that they're not having um, unrecognized rejection. I mean, there are alternatives to biopsies, you know, things like Alimap, um, Alasure testing, and every program approaches that a little differently. But the risk that you take by not doing surveillance biopsies, particularly early on, is that you'll miss rejection. And we know that there are certain patients who are always at increased risk for rejection, such as the younger, female, highly sensitized population, um, patients who um, have had um, exposure to CMV and patients who've had more blood transfusions. There's a lot of things that predispose patients to increased risk for rejection. So it gets really complicated to make a global heart transplant program maneuver that allows you to eliminate patients from clinic and eliminate patients from exposure in the cath lab. And obviously, it's all it's like everything in medicine, it's risks versus benefits. So if we suddenly have a bunch of contamination concerns in our cath lab, well, the bar is even, uh, the threshold is even lower to, to eliminate more, you know, so-called surveillance biopsies, elective biopsies on these patients. So I think every program has to look at their local challenges, their local population, their local um, vulnerable patients, as well as their local epidemic. And they ha that's why they have to be really local experts on what's going on. And I think, again, another plug, this is why I think our paper is really important for the cardiovascular community to read, because this is really something that you can't afford to be ignorant of all of the emerging data. We have to all be up on this and paying attention to what's being posted um, daily, hourly. So I think, I think these are tough questions, but these are the questions we're facing. Yeah, l let me ask you this. I don't know how feasible this is logistically, but just uh, I've been trying to think about this situation in, in our institution uh, as well. Because, uh, you know, we, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, I, I don't think I've worked in any, me personally, I have not worked in a, in a cat lab, which is a negative pressure room. Um, so if you're dealing with a COVID positive patient or you have done a case on a patient who is a COVID positive patient and you now either have another patient who is not COVID positive and you, and you want to do a case, I think the room has to undergo terminal clean. Um, and you know, I, I personally don't know how long we have to wait for before we can get the other patient in. So the best case scenario is dedicate a room for COVID patients and then do your regular cases in the other rooms. But, you know, that is not going to be feasible in every institution. Yeah, and that's what people are saying and about how to tackle it. I mean, we call this cohorting, cohorting your care team, cohorting the population uh, that's at risk and the, and the population that's infected. It's the same recommendation, and this is important for a number of contexts, that same recommendation has been made for when you have your ICU population uh, that has COVID-19 Put them all together. Don't put them scattered throughout multiple units. The same argument is made for the cath lab. So pick a room as best as you can and just say anybody that we have to bring down there who's being ruled out or has COVID-19, uh, that's where they go. And of course, before you even get to that point, ask the question, can we manage this patient in the room that they're in with the appropriate negative pressure and isolation precautions without bringing them to the cath lab? That's why there's really interesting debate right now about bringing back thrombolytics for patients with true acute coronary syndrome, plug and plaque rupture, because it may be better to implement sort of the, what we used to do in the eighties uh, and nineties uh, to an extent. Uh, we may, we may be best off going back to that era uh, in the short term while we're trying to minimize the exposure of our other patients and our healthcare teams. So tough questions, but, um, and as far as the logistics of what's required, required in, uh, in, in the cath lab to do this. Uh, I, I would defer that question to our infectious control experts. I, again, I'm, I'm learning a lot about this, but I, I really don't know that I could answer that question. But it does make a lot of sense to be sensible about who you bring to the cath lab, obviously eliminate all elective cases that you can eliminate and cohort the COVID-19 cases into the same room so that you're not exposing multiple rooms uh, at the same time. Um, thank you, Andrew. Any closing remarks from you? Um, I, I know it's been um, 
a detailed conversation and I uh, applaud you for putting the paper together so expeditiously for all of us and also taking the time out and, and having this uh, recording for the podcast. Any closing remarks for our listeners and our audience? Yeah, I would say my final remarks would just be about the importance of physicians in this time, in this era, being the voice of leadership in our country. We have had so much misinformation, politically oriented spin, that it's time that when we are in the set of crisis, you know, the, the war language has been used and it's appropriate. You know, we are at war with a pandemic and the enemy is not each other. It's not Republicans or Democrats. The enemy is not um, our administrators or, our, or even the public. The enemy is the virus. And now more than ever in the last 100 years, are we facing a situation where physicians and their voices of leadership are so much needed because science and medicine should drive our decision making, not economics or political expediency. And I think it's been frustrating and encouraging some of the things that you see on social media and on the news. Um, I feel like I've never had a period in, in, in my career that I can remember where I've learned so much from so many people all at the same time in such a short period of time. And that's really exciting. And I think some things are going to change forever in how we practice medicine. You know, one bright light on the horizon is we're now learning how to do phone encounters and make them billable. And, and, and that's good for, the, for, for us doing the work of medicine. Um, we've also learned how to do telehealth, um, remote monitoring, video conferencing with patients, and build it into our workflows in ways that, that we never had to do in the same degree. And we're going to learn new skills and learn how to use technology to help us. And this has been a long time coming. And it's the, it's the good thing that's happening as a result of this very bad thing, the pandemic. And so physicians have to be strong voices in their administration, strong voices on the front lines with their nurses to make sure that the nurses are cared for. Um, one thing that I'm doing here is just trying to be a strong advocate for our frontline healthcare workers to make sure that we protect them. And so again, my summary would be physicians speak up. Don't be, um, don't be hiding in the dark. Be educated, be experts on this as best as you can, uh, read the literature and, and be loud voices for advocating for our healthcare workers and for what the public needs to do. We all need to pitch in. I uh, know the very powerful message and, uh, and very powerful closing remarks. I, I completely believe uh, that adversity, um, if you look at it in hindsight and, you know, retrospectively, um, I think brings the best uh, in us. Um, I, I think adversity is important. It, it, it cracks us open. And I think that's when the light falls in, um, you know, just ending on a spiritual note. But Andrew, thank you so much for your time. And, um, you know, thank you for doing this again. And, you know, hopefully we'll uh, get you back on the show for further updates. But this has been very helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much for having yeah, us. Thanks. Bye bye. Dear cardiologists, we want to make this podcast about you and for you. So please email us your critical thoughts, comments and questions at podcast at radcliffe-group.com and visit uscjournal.com for more information. You can also follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram at Radcliffe Cardiology for daily updates. Join thousands of cardiologists and become a Radcliffian by registering to radcliffecardiology.com. You will receive regular newsletters and gain access to hundreds of expert interviews, educational webinars, clinical cases, and peer-reviewed articles from our six medical review journals on general cardiology, interventional cardiology, arrhythmia and electrophysiology, cardiac failure, and vascular and endovascular surgery. Thank you.